Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramp. I got my coffee. I got my kombucha, and it's time to do some Wake Up Missoula time for, I got a guest here from the Montana Repertory Theater, and she's going to be talking about On Golden Pond. So I'll have her on in a bit. Um, news is looking good. Um, Donna Gockler goes to the city council and talks a little bit about the uh, pay schedule and master plan for uh, paying for maintenance at the Fort Missoula Regional Park. I got a flagship Friday video of the week, and I got a pre-critic. Um, there's just a whole bunch of other things out going on here, but I'm not going to keep my guests waiting, so I'm going to kick things off with a little bit of weather. It is currently 25 degrees outside. You have that winter advisory warning happening until about the end of my show, 10 a.m., so stick with me. Uh, 70 per- <laughs> that's a shameless plug. 70% chance of snow happening today. Yesterday, it did snow late last night. We got some of that snow from Bozeman. Not, you know, I'm not, I'm generalizing. I don't actually know if it actually came from Bozeman, but um, everything. <laughs> so tonight, it's 70 to 40% chance of snow. Saturday, you're going to have that 70% chance of snow. So pretty much snow all weekend long. We've been very lucky with a lot of the snow, especially if you're a person who likes to go out and about with skiing or snowboarding. And speaking of which, uh, this is from onthesnow.com. Looks like we got a lot of fresh powder in Whitefish, Blacktail, Big Sky, Bridger Bowl. Uh, Montana Snow Bowl had one inch in the last 72 hours, but that's about to change with all the snow that's coming around through here. Uh, Showdown Montana had just about the same. Discovery Ski Area hasn't had any fresh powder. It's a 25 base. Uh, uh, 52 uh, at the summit. Um, Great Divide, no fresh snow. So most of these places haven't had any fresh snow. Trenton Ski Pass area is still kind of in the red. So uh, you may need to call ahead to see your um, local ski resorts and whatnot. So I found those at onthesnow.com and you can too. So let's talk about some of the news that's happening. Um, Later school mornings sound like an okay idea. And yes, MCPS and people are still talking about it. Uh, Long story short, which usually means long story longer, um, MCPS did a study that said by adjusting the school day to match their sleeping in a, uh, which, uh, sleeping in type of teenage bodies. So the whole idea is that they're going to push the uh, um, the start day to 8.30 a.m. at the MCPS board, tr- board of Trustees meeting on Tuesday night. Superintendent Mark Thane revealed preliminary findings about the cost of shifting high school start times. The board previously agreed that based on evidence by a 24-member school day study committee, it would benefit student health and learning to push high school start times later. Um, of course, um, the thing is, is that by having students come later, the bus schedule would be completely thrown off out of whack because they use a three-tier system where it's just like, okay, you pick up these group of kids early part of the morning, then you put up another group of kids another part of the morning, and then another group of kids. So the whole idea is that the start time for the high schools would require a minimum of 14 additional bus routes. Each bus route is $44,000 annually, so the cost would be $616,000 annually to make this change in the school schedule. Of course, this will be discussed in future meetings, so that you're going to um, basically talk about this. But my basic solution is why not? Why just do the teens? Why not just adjust everybody about half an hour? That would basically solve that issue just in terms of kind of doing, keeping the system in place. All you got to do is just throw the time a little bit later. Anyways, here's some of the state. A privately funded $48 million museum and research uh, center decided uh, to to the history of the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Indian War era. Ag- uh, um, archae- agriculture renderings of a building are ca- uh, captioned. The Eliz- Elizabeth Custer Library. Oh, I'm, I'm, let me get through this. Uh, the Elizabeth Custer Library and Museum of Frontier Women of the West. Elizabeth Custer was the wife of General George um, Armstrong Custer, who led the U.S. forces at the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876. Um, basically, Christopher Court, uh, Courtlander, he purchased, um, he wanted to start his own museum about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and in 1993, after moving to Montana from California, he built a 4,000 square home above a gas station and fast food restaurant on the seven acres surrounding the Crow Reservation. The site in town is close to where the large Indian encampment of the Sioux and Cheyenne was located in 1876 when it was attacked by the U.S. Cavalry. The ensuing battle, which remained the uh, remains of continued interest of pro- to professional amateur historians, resulted in the deaths of more than 260 U.S. soldiers, while Indian casualties have been estimated at 80 at that battle. So, it's been a bumpy road to get the museum off the ground, but Corner, Man- Corner's maneuver to build a privately f- private facility comes as the National Park Service is once again considering rebuilding its aged and run-down visitor center with the Little Big Horn Battlefield National Monument. The structure is so unsafe that the majority of the artifacts within the museum um, has been sent to um, uh, 
arch rival facility in Arizona. Many of Kortner's critics say that history is a hard sell in Montana. Here's some uh, brief overthink of the national stuff. The last ship that transported slaves was uncovered the other day. Um, back in um, Alabama, the uh, bomb cyclone, uh, uh, which is a, a strong wind uh, from the north, blew out uh, the uh, the uh, watery areas and the mud regions of Alabama, which resulted in the reveal of an old slave ship. Um, so a lot of times they're trying to figure out the uh, the source of it. So the ship's owner, Timothy Maher, hired Captain William Forrester to smuggle a shipment of slaves into the South during the time when slavery, um, new slavery, was illegal. So uh, so Meher, he's a wealthy and respected businessman, was an um, uh, proponent of slavery and was convinced he could ship a cargo past post officials without any repercussions. And of course, the, Ham, the, Am, uh, the Alabama Historic Commission said, it is our agency's duty to uphold the state law that manages and protects shipwrecks and archaeological sites in Alabama waters. After receiving the necessary permits and the development of, of research and design, the, the UWF Maritime Archaeology Department can examine whether the vessel is, in fact, the Clotilda. However, such an endeavor requires both funding and planning, so any questions will take time to resolve. So that's basically um, one of the things is that these ships um, uh, was uncovered by some of the, so by a big wind, and it's it's very interesting to learn more about history and whatnot, especially um, some of the uh, darker parts of the American history. So um, I have a art clip for you guys, and this will uh, will run one more week, and this is a brand new art clip featuring the 46th annual um, art auction from the Missouri Museum. So when we come back, we'll have uh, Morgan Solinar on here to talk about On Golden Pond. Hey guys, we're back and we're here with um, Morgan Solonar. I don't know. I, I don't know why I looked down. I was just like down to myself. <laughs> so you're here to talk about On Golden Pond, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, play through the Montana Repertory Theater that's happening tonight and tomorrow, yes. 7:30 tonight, 2 p.m. matinee tomorrow, and mm -hmm. 7:30 p.m. tomorrow night. So let's talk about this play a bit. What can people expect by going to this play? Yeah, so it's a comedy, and it is kind of a typical American story about forgiveness and friendship and family and um, the simple things in life set on a cabin on Golden Pond so kind of homey rustic vibes and this is a six-person cast mm -hmm. uh, you it's gonna be traveling all around the state of Montana and beyond of course yes um, you told me that you're going to be in Texas, you're going to be in West Virginia, you're going to be all over places. Yeah. What is the setting of this play? Where is this taking place? It's in Maine, um, and so it's just on the pond. It's kind of like a lake house sort of deal. Um, so, yeah. Cool. And um, you also said that this is based in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have any like music from the 70s? <laughs> I wish. No, unfortunately, it's late 70s, early 80s, so it's very... Uh, we got a lot of banjo music happening in there during the scene changes, which is kind of funny. So. And uh, what is your part? So I play Billy, which is the son of Bill, who's the boyfriend of Chelsea, who's the daughter of Norman, <laughs> if you can figure that out. That was very confusing. Um, and so Billy is kind of um, Norman's best friend, 
kind of becomes his best friend in the show. So he's thirteen year old boy. So. And, and then of course you. Have, I think in my mind I'm just like generalizing the play. It's like Norm is like I've seen things. I've been where you've been. Yeah. And that that kind of thing where they kind of like have a connection where like uh, I think that like teenagers and like older people like it's kind of like. Teenagers have this thing where they're just already done with something mm-hmm. before it's, you know, and then of course old people are honestly done with every, all the yeah, drama and stuff. Totally. I think it's good because I think Norman and Billy kind of help each other out and Norman's kind of done with his life and he's kind of, kind of resigned to the fact that he's going to die whereas Billy just thinks everything is super unfair and so they're both really good for each other because Billy gives Norman some kind of life and then Norman kind of instills some like respect and um, self-confidence in Billy so it's a really good give and take relationship so yeah. every part is very crucial to this play mm-hmm. as well because each part every every person has like a monologue everybody has like their yeah. own uh, spotlight on them at any given totally. time so what can you tell me about uh, some of the characters in the play and how they interact with one another so Norman's wife, Ethel, is basically the, the perfect grandma. She's very excited all the time. Um, Ernest Thompson, who wrote the play, he gave us a little note before we um, started performing, and Ethel is loosely based around his mother, and he said her, his mother would follow um, the play around, um, hyped up on coffee from McDonald's. So very excited, caffeine drinker. And Ethel is kind of the foil for Norman, who is very, like, grouchy, not grouchy but very um kind of a typical old man you yeah. know and ethel's very excited and baking cookies and mm-hmm. making sure that everyone's okay so that's kind of how that relationship so works. are there anything people can expect and also uh them some things that are just kind of like w- would might throw people off without you know spoiling the whole entire story yeah i think it's it's funny which is interesting because there's a lot it's very witty ernest thompson is so good at making good jokes and the actors have really good comedic timing so um it is it has a lesson and it is you know is somewhat depressing in the fact that it's about growing old but it is funny and it's very heartwarming which is cool, cool. so, so um, you guys are gonna be here uh, for the next couple days you guys are go, gonna go out so let's talk about some of the uh, tour dates of some other places that uh, may get a chance to see you yeah so we are in Billings and then Lewistown and um, yes that's all that I know off the top of my head right now but we go Billings on um, Monday, I think, and then Lewistown the next day. And where can people uh, go online to basically find more information about this? Um, yeah, you can go to the UM Arts box office, or you can go to grizzticks.com, um, and there's a whole bunch of information. Or you could go to the Montana Repertory, Montana Repertory uh, the- Theater website. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm assuming, um, like, Montana Repertory Theater, I've already associated them with, like, Shakespeare in the Park mm. and this and that. Um, w- w- and you... I mean, it's such an interesting time because school just started, and I know I asked you this question before. Yeah, totally. But, um, and you're also a student at the University of Montana, and um, so you you started earlier this uh, this year, mm-hmm. um, like, and you guys worked really hard, like, the last yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, we started the 2nd of January, and we worked just eight-hour days for two weeks straight until the 19th, and then we opened and had our opening night gala party, and then we went on the road. So it's been a lot of long days, but very much worth it. But you also said you you wear many hats in the show. Mm -hmm. So besides playing Billy, what other uh, things do you do in the show? So I'm the wardrobe technician, so I make sure all of the costumes are washed and pressed and put together and the dressing rooms are set up and they have everything that they need. And then I also um, help unload the set, so I'm another crew member. So we load in at 10 a.m. and put up the set right up until curtain, and then I go be an actor for a couple hours, and then after that I do wardrobe, and then after that I take down the set and put it back up in the trucks, and then we drive to the next place. Oh, wow, so you're going to be driving all the way to Florida, West Virginia? Yep, Woo. driving all that way. <laughs> yeah, in big budget trucks and little minivans. So, have you done it before? Um, I've not done a national tour before. I did go to the um, international China tour with the rep, and we took to Kill a Mockingbird. I played Jem mm. Finch, but we, that was a much um, simpler tour because it was in China, so they had our set there for us and everything. We oh. didn't have to take it down, but yeah. All right, so um, once again, um, tell people where and when the show is. So it is tonight at 7.30, and then tomorrow at 2 and 7.30, and then you can come back the February 1st and 3rd for performances. All right, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me. Is Thank there anything so else? Um, I just think that it's a really awesome, funny play, and you should come see it. All right. Well, thanks, and we'll be back with plenty more show right after this. And so what I want to tell you about today is a tool that Peter and I have developed in collaboration with a working group that started about three and a half years ago. 
Peter and I gathered up a bunch of um, information from the project level requests from wilderness managers. We looked at the literature that was out there and really tried to, to pull together our first attempt at a tool to support these kinds of decisions. So we brought together an interagency team here to Missoula in March of 2014. We gnashed our teeth, our, our uh, sort of collective teeth for three days. And then we went out and pilot tested our revised draft of the tool with 16 wilderness units. So we looked for a, a good mix of ecological interventions, regions, agencies. Um, it included region six. So I spent some time with folks out at the Portland office looking at white bark pine in the sort of Pesaten project. And then we took the feedback from those pilot tests and we revised the tool again, um, sent it out for review, and uh, fairly recently have released the final version. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that. Too. And I think it was Keith Harden who, who said that World War I was mostly, what, 99% idle time and 1% death, terror, terror horror. <laughs> and I think that's probably true. Most of these soldiers, in fact, basically sat around a lot and they waited a lot in these trenches. And they, some of them used that time, in fact, to make what we would call arguably works of art. Of course, now this is made mostly in the hand by individuals who are not trained artists. So this is in that category of untrained art, what used to be called naive art or primitive art or even outsider art. It's just art made by local yokels, you know, the common, common individuals. And so it's art that has artistry, but it's arguably, you know, works of art. 250,000 Liberians lost their lives. <coughs> through stray bullets, through malaria, through starvation, through the war. All of us African countries realized that Liberia was going to ruin. They decided to send in a peacekeeping force. And they told Liberia, if you were able to go on board the ship that brought the peacekeepers, go ahead. By this time, uh, things got so dangerous, my wife and I would go out each day looking for food. And I remember this day, we found toothpaste. And toothpaste never tasted so sweet. That's what we have for lunch and dinner, toothpaste. I still remember the toothpaste, it's called Pepsi Dent. I don't know if you know Pepsi. <laughs> but that's what we have for lunch and dinner. It was good. Yeah, like, um, uh, I'm working with these three, because today we can't do stop motion, so I'm working with these three on a live action video we're doing. Uh, we might continue our MCAT, or we might try something else. But I think it's really fun. What's that? What was that? Who's there? question is, uh, you know, how much am I going to save on my bill every month? And related to that is, what's the payback? You know, when is this system going to pay for itself? This is a pretty straightforward calculation to do, honestly. Um, I just put in this graph at the top to illustrate the point that solar systems produce a lot more energy during the summer than they do during the winter, about six times as much. So when I approach this, I just take the monthly average and use that to do this calculation. This hypothetical um, base case I did produced monthly savings of about $56, which gave it a payback of just under 13 years. And I think that's what you're gonna find typically for these systems, it's somewhere in the range of 12 to 14, um, although the installers may wanna um, weigh in on that. So pretty, pretty straightforward calculation there. Um, one thing to note is if you do take a loan, depending on the way the loan is structured, your payment is probably gonna be on the order of 100 to $140 a month. Um, so you're not gonna be able to take a loan and save enough money to make your loan payment. And I dug into that a little bit further and prices are gonna have to come down significantly before uh, that's the case. Even if you got a 0% interest loan, this would still be, um, your loan payment would be higher than your savings. 
and these new programs will be airing all weekend long on MCAT. Let's talk about uh, uh, let's talk about some um, movies that are coming out. You know, you want to talk about some movies that are coming out? Yeah, let's talk about some movies that are coming out. Uh, the first one is from the studio that think teens want to rise up against a fascist regime in the distant future comes The Maze Runner, The Death Cure. I've seen the first two of The Maze Runner movies. Um, basically, in the second movie, there's no maze. Third movie, there's probably not a maze. It's more just like an action movie in a dystopian future. But more into the background about how the maze came to be and the kids who must save the world by finding a cure to death. Uh, hence the title. Regardless of how you feel about Poco post-apocalyptic beautiful teens, the movie is just that. And most of all, the teens in this movie are pretty much like early 20s. They're, they've, they've grown past their maze running days because, you know, they can only keep them young for so long. I was blocked by that thing. Okay. Hostiles. This movie is a simple get a hardened racist Civil War vet to escort a family of Indians through a dangerous territories and along the way find peace on his own inner turmoil of his own devices. Redemption is the name of the game because why not? Uh, but Hostiles is the name of the movie. Christian Bale stars as the army captain tasked with taking the Cheyenne man back to Montana. Sweet. Montana plug. Sweet. Um, that's where I am. <laughs> they have an all-star cast and a movie that was aired in Montana for natives and with the director just to make sure this fictitious, mind you, fictitious movie was in retrospect with everybody. I don't know how Hollywood has always exploited all types of people and all walks of life, so why not again? Okay, <laughs> that got a little too personal. Uh, this next movie will get you going, but probably not any local screens in town because this is a foreign film. The insult fictitious movie is which a media circus surrounding a case puts Lebanon through a social explosion, forcing Tony and Yazir to re, uh, reconsider their lives and prejudices. Tony is a Christian from Lebanon, and I just want to hear like um, 90s sitcom music in a court. Uh, a Palestinian refugee, Yazir. This movie becomes less like a one-on-one -on -one fight with injustice and turns into a media frenzy that draws a line in the in the in the country. I mean, of course, I um I actually do kind of sound interested in this movie because it's it's a it's a little mixture of Ace in the Hole with a lot of No Man's Land, like when it, within a courtroom. So, you know, but you know, it, it has these kind of movies are you know foreign movies are interesting because you know the Hollywood movies they're always so predictable. But when it comes to foreign movies, you just don't know how they're gonna curve themselves. And you know this is uh, and this is the kind of movies that kind of stay with you long after the credits roll. So of course, uh, thanks No Man's Land, which is a movie about a Bosnian and Slovak before Yugoslavia finally split into two countries. So ba basically, imagine the Anchorman meme that says, "Huh, that escalated quickly," and then you get this movie, The Insult. All right, so that pretty much does it for all the movies that are pretty much coming out this weekend. There's a whole bunch of other ones I'm assuming are coming out, um, but um, that's basically all I had to say. And, you know, you like movies, right? And here is a bunch of uh, – here's a nice little pitch meeting made by the Flagship Kids, and this is a brand-new Flagship Friday video of the week like they always are. But this one is special because it was just made just this week. So here's this, and when I come back, I'll talk about City Council, and Donna Glockler will be talking about how we're going to afford to pay for maintenance at former. Missoula Regional Park, so stay with me. What I was thinking, I want to make a movie, Mr. Wise Up. I want, it, I want it to be big, original, real, and I want it to be different. I wanted the American people to look at this movie as new, exciting, uh, just, just something to catch their eye. So, what I obviously would like to do is have a foreign character. No, no, no. Uh, American, for a big budget American movie. This movie is about challenging adversity. No, no, American challenging foreign adversity for their movie. Yes, big budget American movie, so you can just shut up. Okay, so here's my idea. I love the idea for you guys, but what if we had the daredevil played by a blind actor? Lots of funny bloopers. Come on. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. This is movie. This is not funny. This is serious. Yes, yes. Good idea. People want to see people who are blind moving around in an action movie. For you, I don't want to see some American foreigner trying to solve 
foreign diversity. Yeah. So the companion of Daredevil, which won't be Daredevil, it'll be Devil Dare. <sighs> Movie called Double Dog Dare because a companion will be a dog! A golden retriever! I came here to show my ideas, not yours, mine. I paid you to be here. I don't even know why you're sitting there at the head desk. Head chair. I'm sitting here because I make movie. You're sitting there because you want to make movie. Now let me sit here and listen to rest of pitch. So there's gonna be a dog that's also impaired, but please stop and let me finish my pitch. Hey, very rude. This is why he gets to make a movie. So, we're gonna have Guy Fieri on our show when we're making this movie to hint at the movie. We're gonna talk about Tabasco sauce, g bananas, uh, uh, enchiladas, um, how, what he does in his free time. What is his house made of? I don't know. Something nice, you know? Oh, um, do you know where the bathroom's at? Oh, it's right over there. Oh, thank you. That gave me another idea. What if we told it about a strong American hero looking for the bathroom? And we make it all about that, but we still call it Double Dare Dog Dare. I like it! Uh, I, what if we had that one Goosebumps episode with the masks, but with the robot? So, yes, Robot is strong American hero looking for bathroom. He is still played by me, of course. And as you can see, I used your idea as well. So uh, everyone wins. You got it. I love it. Thank you. And uh, what do you think? I... I can't. I, I can't do this anymore. You know, it's hard working with you, Mr. Wiseau. Okay? Just... I'm gonna ask Steven Spielberg for another idea, or get him to produce it. I, it's been nice knowing you, Tommy hey. Wiseau. Hey, I did not tell you to get up! Where are you going? Oh, wait, stop! Where are you going? What are you doing? Get over here! I'm calling my You're lawyer. supposed to make big American movie! Everyone betray me! Ah! Ah! Why? What? No one can see my vision. At the end, I just wanted to have like a, a, a drum kick from that movie. But anyways, uh, here are some of the things. Uh, here are some plug-in for MCAT. If you guys are interested in coming down to MCAT for our Saturday drop-ins, we do that every single Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. Me and a couple other employees here at MCAT host a, uh, a creative experience for kids aged 9 to 13 to come down and learn everything they know, need to know about Lego stop animation and perhaps making their own kind of movie just like you just saw there. It's a creative experience. We, we, don't, we, we let the kids express themselves and we try to uh, get everybody involved and everyone working together. It's a great way to promote teamwork and um, movie experiences. So, if you want to learn more about MCAT, you go to MCAT.org, but if you want to learn more about my show, <coughs> you can go to wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. So nice we made you write it out twice. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, you can like us on Facebook, and you subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Three different things, meaning the same exact thing. All social media, all different times. You can see past interviews, past videos, and past flagship programs along with dub and stuff and more. All it's on this website. You can Google Wake Up Missoula just like that. And now, this face that you see here 
with that L in the background, it's time for some city council. Kicking things off is Parks and Conservation. The city and county partnership for the maintenance of Fort Missoula Park has been ongoing for 30 years. With the addition of the city portion of parklands and development of Fort Missoula Regional Park, which is now what it's called, um, and phase one is complete, which is the city portion of Fort Missoula Regional Park, they have further built on this partnership. The term of the agreement is five years beginning January 1st, 2018, and running through December 20, uh, 31st, 2024. The interim agreement, which ended December 31st, 2017, will be replaced with this new one. So Director of Parks and uh, Rec, Donna Gockler, says that this is nothing new, but an evolution of these policies that will strengthen the ties between county and city parklands. So here is Donna Gockler talking about that. Because it was really, really important to me as the Director of Parks and Recreation that both the council and the commissioners understood that if we built this new park, we were adding 93 brand new acres of developed park to city parks, and that we would have a 156 acre regional park with some pretty amazing facilities, and there was going to be no way that we would be able to, to charge enough fees in an outdoor setting to recover the cost of operating that park. And so what you're see, going to see in this management agreement as I walk through it is references to that Ballard and King pro forma study, references to the maintenance impact statement. And then um, we also, um, that was really important. Um, and when I say we, I'm mostly referencing Lisa and myself and our staff, that everybody understood there would be an additional cost beyond the bond because you cannot use a general obligation bond for maintenance once that park was built. All right, so that was Donna Gockler talking about just because they built a park doesn't mean they ha the money was used to pay for the maintenance of the park. And that's what the biggest thing that's happening with the uh, city, county, Parks and Rec, is they're trying to figure out a budget to have the maintenance on the Fort Missoula Regional Park. And since phase one is complete, and phase two will be complete later this year, um, and then the overall phase three will be complete by um, a long ways from now, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. So what Parks and Rec are asking for, the bond that will finance operations, which amounts for the balance fiscal year 2018 upon councils and commissioners approval will be 163,833 for the year. These figures are based on the 2014 maintenance impact statement and consider the reality of construction weather and opening dates amounts the city have received to date is 48,368. Donna Gockler talks about phase one's completion and talks about where we are in phase two. Let me just find that. Hmm. Here it is. We opened phase one of Fort Missoula Regional Park, which was the city-owned parcel, the western half, which is actually 93 acres, composed of 83 acres of city land that was purchased from the University of Montana in 1997, plus a 50-year lease on 10 more acres from the University of Montana where the western edge of the park is, where the parking is. Uh, or a lot of the parking off at 36th Street if you've been a park user. Um, and so we opened that in uh, uh, April of last year, and we've had phenomenal use, uh, well, even beyond our expectations. And we are just uh, completing phase two this spring, and we'll have our second grand opening on Thursday evening, June 28th. So put that on your calendar. Uh, and then we will complete the park. Uh, the, the dog park will open later this fall because uh, that's where we're backing construction out. And, um, and a lot of that will be native vegetation, so it'll take longer. And then we will be completely done, hopefully by, say, a year from this June with all punch list warranty items and we'll be full going. All right, so um, so the the price ticket price now is just going to be for the annual year because phase one is already done. Phase two, hopefully, will be complete in June, and it's going to be a transitional period for maintenance. Because think about it in terms of like uh, lawn care, uh, basic facility cleaning up, and all that stuff. Because it's a big park, and uh, basically, if you think about it, mowing the lawn and stuff like that, one person by themselves is usually about forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, especially if they're in the Missoula County employment parks and rec 
that's how much they would get for lawn maintenance. And then there's other maintenance along the way with uh, mechanics and fixing the things. So the people who will be on staff at the building there as well will get X amount of money as well. So the whole idea of maintenance uh, kind of adds up with, uh, if you if you really look at it, it's like four four new jobs for the, uh, the for maintenance in terms of Fort Missoula Regional Park. Uh, let's move on. Uh, there's a little estimate on how much longer Parks and Rec uh, consider Fort Missoula Regional Park complete. Year from June is pretty close, and many of the money that Fort Missoula will get from use will go to pay for maintenance. And if there is, and if they're able to get like a net profit, um, the, the, right now they're trying to feel it out because they don't know how much it's going to cost for maintenance overall. It's the, the they'll be able to put more money back into the park uh, like a business. And Donna Gockler talks about how they're going to be uh, talking about money and talk about proceeds and how they're going to be running uh, the park. Um, We've already approved the numbers that are in this agreement in our budget process. So they're already in there from the interim agreement and for the fiscal year. And what this agreement states is that the agreement is good for five years, but that the budget will be reviewed annually within the city council and the county commissioner's budget process. And what we wanted to be able to do is have some certainty on a year-to-year -year basis for five years on how we were going to manage and operate. But we wanted the ability and the flexibility to make sure that, that the park was funded and that we cannot commit council budget anyway, more than one year at a time, or commissioner budget. And so if that makes sense. We also have long-term management agreements with Missoula Art Park, uh, MDA, and this is how we do those too. It doesn't commit us to the long-term budget. It commits us to the long-term agreement. So Donna. All right, so that was uh, uh, talks just a little about how they're going to be uh, continually annually looking at the budget throughout this time as well. Um, yeah, these these funds operate like an enterprise fund, uh, which they kind of go over, and has ability to save and build money for certain projects that can be make going to these parks um, incentivized. For example, they have a retro gaming night uh, at Former's Original Park where they play a live version of Pac-Man. Uh, overall, this was an update and will continue to be discussed because uh, they don't know how much running Former's Original Park is going to cost since it's not even complete yet. But th they're just basically kind of feeling it out, and one hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars is the estimate. Uh, is what they estimate for running and maintaining the park. Land use and planning. Back on the ticket today is the demolition permit for historic buildings in Missoula. Key considerations of this amendment, including provisions, definitions, and purpose of intent statement requiring pre-application consultant, con 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 consent whew, con consultation, sorry about that, an extended review period, stretch plans for redevelopment, and mandatory deconstruction plans. Um, this is an update to an already existing amendment. Staff will propose a $200 fee under a separate referral that amends the development services fee resolution. Gwen Jones, talk about the old Merck and how uh, Merck kind of helped um, reestablish what this demolition permit will mean. Many people on council were um, here for when in the summer of 2016 we handled the Merck and that demolition application and it was it was kind of the perfect storm. It was one of the most historical buildings in Missoula. It was a large commercial building. It had been empty for six years plus and it is a very passionate touchstone in the community. And as we worked through that process, I think many people on council came to the um, understanding that the ordinance that we were working under was it was a very simple ordinance which can work well in some situations but I think we found that we needed a lot more structure to really be able to have a better process all right so that was Gwen Jones talking about she's the one that's spearheading this update um, trying to fix any kind of like clarify clarifying any language and so we come to this committee meeting where historic preservation committee would create a better process when de demolition buildings during an era of growth and construction in Missoula the applicant of course who wants to destroy <laughs> these buildings must demonstrate that enforcement of the historic preservation section 20.85.085 will cause unreasonable economic hardships to the property and that the applicant has made a good faith effort to find a reasonable alternative that would result in the preservation, renovation, and reuse of historic resources, but also if the building is completely unusable for rede redevelopment, then they would have to go through this process to be like, hey, 
there's nothing I can do with this building. It's it's awful. It's completely terrible. Blah blah blah. Basically, if a new slash current owner wants to tear down, they must prove that their business would benefit from this and give back to the community via best practice. Amy Shearer talks about how demolition can be justified in this. A certificate of economic hardship um, basically provides the evidence that no reasonable alternative exists um, and that they have to submit it as it relates to current economic and market rate data for Missoula. And then we just go through a list of, of related things to the property, such as the amount paid when the owner bought it, um, the cost of any improvements, appraisals, uh, consideration for profitable adaptive reuses, uh, if it's income producing, annual gross income, things like that that will actually itemize and help the HPC really be able to understand what they're evaluating here. For the feasibility. All right, so um, that was Emmy Sure talking a little bit about that. Um, Stacy Anderson um, asks about going over H HBC's head in terms of like if they privately own the building and they don't and they want to be able to actually. There's there's, there's an, it's an interesting thing uh, because historic buildings are on the national registry for historic buildings, and just as sure as you can apply for historic registration for an old building, you can also request it to be taken off. So you don't even have to go to HBC for this demolition permit as well. So this is kind of explains it a little bit more because it's not as simple as you may think. So from your presentation last week, you had said that it was up to individual um, owners to list their home or buildings on the historic registry, and that then owners could also take their property off the registry. Is there a way, if you know that you're planning on going, you want to eventually demo the place that you have, can you then delist it so that you can avoid this process? You, you could feasibly do that, um, and that is a process through City Council. And I don't believe it's been done, but you can, you, you could. It does take a bit of time. You have to go through city council and then the state and then the Department of Interior. Um, so. so there is an approval process in terms of to delist? No, it oh. just takes time. Okay. It's just like getting through those steps mm -hmm. until it's finally actually delisted. Okay. But since it is. So basically, um, uh, there's no incentive to delist uh, the uh, historic building because it's in itself, it's, it's its own process. So it's basically a whole nother process in itself. Jim, Newson, Nim, Jim Nugent, um, city uh, attorney, talks about the complicated nature of demolition of historic buildings. And this is what he has to say. And it also has to do with, like, um, since he's the attorney, he also deals with fluctuating and flexible um, permits and laws and ordinances help them some of the law about takings a lot of the law about takings is an evolving law and it's going to be driven by factual circumstances and again you can't come up with a cookie cutter uh, explanation about takings because the factual circumstances are going to vary so broadly so uh, you kind of have to focus in on the specific factual circumstances and exactly what's going on uh, and try and uh, work with that. So you almost have to work with it on a case-by-case -case basis, and they can work through Emmy and Lavelle as the staff or directly contact our office. But we prefer, of course, if they work through the staff because then the staff uh, is aware of exactly what the concerns are, and they also are able to come up with some way to help maybe get some information but I don't think you can do it in advance because it's going to change uh, depending on the factual circumstances right so to that point then all right so yeah that's basically it uh, many things uh, from this ordinance update is to protect not only historic buildings but the future of investors who wish to improve the Missoula area while not eliminating the flavors that make Missoula Missoula Gwen Jones talk about the pros and cons of this demolition permit there, there's a balancing point there. So we're trying not to ask for too much. On the other hand, built into this ordinance also, there's a section where the HPC can call on third parties to come in and provide information. I don't know if the city wants to pay for that. Hopefully there would be volunteer. I don't know. But in litigation, you're typically going to get a pro and a con. And that's what would be in front of, if, if there's a, a pro, 
and the HPC feels like there is a need for a, a con, they can throw out that lifeline to get that information in. And then, and then they're going to have to grapple with it. So I don't know. But, but I think it's something to, I'm curious to see comments on it. And as it goes to HPC and planning board, I think it's a concept. All right. So basically, with the pros and cons of it, is that you can hire an outside source to be um, to do a study on the building that you wish to demolish, and be like, "Hey, guys, is this a building that can and be, and and should be de demolished for a new building, or is this is there any way uh, like?" And then of course, H HBC can be like. Uh, I, we don't. We're going to get a second opinion on this, so we're going to hire someone else on our end to check if the building is feasible and can be re re renewed and stuff like that. So that's kind of like a little clarification of that. Um, so once again, um, here is Gwen Jones with uh, for the last quote of my city council report. Registered, nationally registered building. Um, an issue with the Merc was: was it for sale, or was it tied up in a contract? because some people are like, it's for sale. Anyone could come in and buy it. Other people said, well, yes, it's on the market, but someone has a contract on it. I'm not going to go spend money on it, evaluating it, if I'm second in line and there's no way I can ultimately purchase this building. That was That is something that we tried to deal with this. And in fact, I'm going to follow up with some real estate professionals in town because I would think they would possibly have some insight on how to address this. Because in my mind, we're more likely than not to get a local buyer than an out-of-state buyer. And secondly, once this initial process comes to the historic preservation officer, and maybe this is something that we should codify, I think there should be some kind of public notice putting it out there. It doesn't have to be, it can just be a small notice, but the preservation community has its ear to the ground in this community and in western Montana, and so that gives two or three months then of notice that this is possibly coming on the market and then if there is that window of 30 days when there are no other contracts attached and it truly is open and up for sale for a full price officer full price offer that's the scenario that we want to create so we have tried to get there i'm not sure if we're 100 percent there yet but i wanted to clarify because it's very hard to come in and buy a one or two or three million dollar building with 25 days but if All right, so that was uh, Gwen Jones talking about that. And then some closing um, words. The problem with the original ordinance was the overall lack of focus of how and where to go when tearing down buildings and moving forward without destroying the character of downtown Missoula. The bias, on the other hand, is that Missoula is showing favoritism towards local businesses without giving much consideration to outside job creators. Lots to think about and lots to consider as the city moves forward with thinning the broad brush of this historic um, preservation and demolition ordinance. Of course, you can watch these meetings and more by logging on to ci.missoula.mt.us. This is the perfect website for anybody who is interested in learning everything about city government and more, and also get involved. I mean, there's always openings and boards and commissions and stuff like that. At first, you won't necessarily get paid for your time for the commissions, but it's a great step into politics and to get involved with uh, city government and move on from there. So ci.missoula.mt.us is a wonderful website. All right, guys, now it's time for events. So um, let's talk about some of the events that are happening um, in and around the city of Missoula. Starting this morning, uh, the future of higher education in Montana uh, an event that happened in the past about an hour ago, starting at 8 a.m. this morning, the 2018 Economic Outlook Seminar, the Future of Higher Education in Montana, U.S. and Montana Outlooks, Real Estate, Housing, Manufacturer Outlooks, Healthcare, Forest Industries, Missoula, and Revalley Outlooks, um, Energy, Agriculture, Local, Expert Reports, and more. And that's going to be at the Hilton Garden Inn. I, I believe it'll go. it's ongoing, which is why I put it on here as well. If your kid walking um, from um, basically crawling to walking and wants to do some tumbling Mismo Roots and Missoula Indoor Sports Arena does all sorts of those physical gymnastic activities from 12 a.m. to about 12 p.m. noon today. For Family Story Time and Tiny Tales start at 10.30 a.m. this morning. Have your kid uh, exposed to books at the Missoula Public Library starting at 10.30 a.m. Spectrum Discovery Center always does daily events and, s and more like that. They're doing some nanoscience, so look into some microscopes, learn about the small uh, makeup of life. Starting at 11 a.m. at the Tool 8, 12, 2, I know, I, I completely memorized, I just wrote in 11 a.m. Spectrum Nanoscience, and I remember everything. So if you're uh, th under three, you get in free. Yarns and watercolor starting 
at uh, the Museo Public Library at 12 noon. And this is, you know, you get to uh, knit and crochet and do all sorts of yarns, um, learn a little bit of that. And also there's a watercoloring class, but be aware that they are usually limited to about 10 per of these classes. And yeah, it, it happens every single week, every Friday. Bridge and cribbage at the Missoula Senior Center starting at 1230. Um, Tween Teen Art After School Program, Art is Magic, at the Zootown Arts Community Center starting at 3.45 p.m. Just enough time for those kids to get out of class and get on down to Zootown Arts Community Center. Uh, imagine the world of witchcraft and wizardry in this five-week tween teen after school camp. Students will explore a variety of media, including, but not limited to, book building, metal smithing, and jewelry making. So it's an all-encompassing thing that happens at Zootown Arts Community Center starting this Friday and going on for five weeks. Shape, shift, Art by Kelly Lowe and O'Connell. So Radius Gallery is hosting a, a, an exhibit from January 26th to the, uh, February 24th. Art by Pamela Kelly, Beth Lowe, and Seth O'Connell. Open reception starts tonight at 5 to 7 p.m. It's not even first Friday. Um, presenting new works by three exceptional Montana artists in Radius Gallery for his exhibit of 2019. This show will be augmented uh, by Artful Living Space Vignette's design for Lee Talbot. Um, Happy Days um, is still playing this weekend and it'll end on Sunday on Golden Pond. You heard from my interview that I had with uh, Morgan Solinar. She'll be playing Billy in, on, on Golden Pond at the University of Montana. Bear Bay Dance is also doing a thing this weekend as well. Um, and other nightly events that are happening are Showdown at the Sunrise Saloon, country music. You got funk music happening at the VFW. Money Penny is going to be at the Union Club. It's going to be miscellaneous music, so dance music. Five Alarm Funk is going to be at the Top Hat Lounge. And that kind of does it for your Friday events. I'm going to breeze through the Saturday events. If you're interested in doing some CPR and first aid, Dickinson Life Learning Learning Center is the place to be starting at 830. And in the morning, they have a bunch of these CPR classes. So get an update on your CPR certification. Winter Market, if you uh, like the um, Farmer's Market, uh, Knickknack Market, and um, Under the Bridge Market, you'll love the Winter Market, which continues this on well until uh, the beginning of the, the Farmer's Market. So it's going to be at um, Missoula Senior Center. If you're interested in doing some prep class, classical drawing workshop, Missoula Fine Art Studio at 10 a.m. is hosting a class is a two-day workshop designed to give students a head start in figure class or in an all-around basic drawing technique. Students will learn the studio basics, drawing techniques, methods, and the studio's basics step-by-step -step while making a master copy of the 19th century uh, bo Barg drawing course. Whew. Zoo Town Kickers. So if you have a kid, two and three, four and five, and seven, uh, six and seven, you get all the Missoula Indoor Sports Arenas hosting soccer beginning soccer for all these kids. From 10 to 11 a.m., it's two and three-year-olds. From 11 a.m. to 12 a.m., four to five-year-olds. And of course, 12 to 1 p.m., it's six and seven-year-olds. And you can register at MissoulaIndoor.com, or you can just drop in and sign up. Um, the Right Stuff and Jack Shiflet is going to be at Living Art Missoula. It's Living Art of Montana is a drop-in Saturday writing workshop facility by Jack Shiflet. The Right Stuff is for winners, uh, writers, <laughs> it's for winners, no, it's for writers and non-writers alike. We'll use easy guided writing prompts and explore writing as a tool for self-expression, offered free to charge for adults 18 and older living with illness or loss. No experience necessary. You can call them at 549-5329. Or you can log on to livingartofmontana.org for more information. The river runs through it, and so can you. Le uh, learning to fly fish as a New Year's resolution is happening at Cabela's. Missoula Cabela's is hosting a fly fishing tutorial and, ha and learning how to fly fish like your famous Ben Affleck. No, no, Ben Affleck. No, Brad Pitt. And the river runs through it. Um, so you can check that out. It's happening at 11 a.m. tomorrow. R-M-E-F Kids Event, Rocky Mountain Elf, uh, Elk Foundation um, are teaching kids about birds. So you can come to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation tomorrow at 11 a.m. This is from 11 to 1 p.m. Osprey demonstration from the Missoula Natural History Center. And this is a free event for children. 2 p.m. matinee show of MCT's Happy Days Bear Bait Dance. Still num live um, number seven, Contemporary Dance. And On Golden Pond will be doing matinees tomorrow at 2 p.m., which is pretty much all the things that are happening, there's a lot of late night events pretty much from there on. So nothing really happens in Saturday afternoons. So just want to remind you guys that our Saturday drop-ins are at MCAT. It happens every single Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m.
All right, so let's talk about um, some of the late night events that are happening on your Saturday. And here are they from. So DJ Music is going to be at the Badlander. Ten Years Gone is going to be Country of the Sunrise Saloon. Karaoke is going to be at the VFW. Cash for Junkers is going to be Union Club. Joe Hurtler and Rainbow Seekers is going to be rock music and miscellaneous jam bands at the Top Hat Lounge tomorrow night. But be aware, I do have a Sunday event because auditions for 39 Steps at MCT. It's Alfred Hitchcock-centered um, play, which uh, takes place from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m. on the third floor of the MCT Center for Performing Arts. So you can use this chance to go um, audition, and then you can go to his 2 p.m. matinee of um, Happy Days after the fact. So they're looking for um, one to seven women, Two to f eight men, ages 16 and older. The Missoula Community Theater is excited to welcome back the guest director, Myers, who is currently the artistic director for the Fort Peck Summer Theater. He's directed and performed extensively around the country. So they're doing some open auditions for this. Um, and also, yeah, that's pretty much does it for um, some of the things that are happening this weekend long. You can uh, audition for an MCT play. It, it's a Missoula Community Theater play, so you guys can check that out. Um, that about does it for everything that you need to know about what's happening in and around the city of Missoula. So it's time to, for me to play an original song by moi, which... Usually, if you've seen my show on Fridays, you know exactly that this is coming. So, thanks for joining me, guys. And here is some nice, cool music. And for Wicked Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Mm -hmm. 